than anywhere else in the country. Um, so names was one of the things that survived. Uh, another thing that survived was music, and this, uh, to this point I'm indebted to a scholar named Sylvian Duf, who has been researching um, the connections between West African music and New World music, primarily blues, um, the relationship of the, the, the banjo to, um, to African music. Uh, and one of the things that she identified was the relationship of the um, call to prayer, the, the, the kind of vocal uh, practices in Muslims giving the call to prayer being reflected in um, African work songs amongst the enslaved population, especially the holler songs. And, and what I'm going to play uh, are two clips that you can compare. Um, and what I want you to listen to, because they're not singing the same thing, obviously, but I want you to listen to the timber and the vibrato of their voice and the way the notes are elongated and the phrasing of, 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 of the tones. So the first is the call to prayer. Um, Freedom. 
Um, I don't think he was able to raise all the money, so he went to went back to West Africa, but had been so kind of culturally displaced. He ended up coming back to America. It was not a happy ending, even though you know he he was discovered. But he was not the only person. There are several other diaries um, that were discovered uh, much later uh, in in uh, in American history that people had to kind of go back and translate and realize what, what was there. So names, music, writings, and religious practices. Now the religious practices, they didn't last very long. By the time of the 1930s and late 30s, during the Great Depression, uh, Franklin Roosevelt established the Works Projects Administration. And this was kind of like an employment stimulus <laughs> package to employ people who are out of work, primarily uh, artists and scholars and intellectuals and, and others who and were paid to go throughout the country and document life in America. So you have people like photographer um, Dorothy Lang who went around taking pictures of the, and most of like, the iconic pictures of the Great Depression were taken by Dorothy Lang. You had uh, writers like Zora Neale Hurston who traveled down south and chronicled folk tales of, of African Americans down south. And you also have people who traveled, especially to the Sea Islands that I mentioned, um, and interviewed those who were either descendants of slaves or who were themselves once slaves. Right? So many of these people are up in age. And some of them remember either um, seeing their parents or themselves uh, talk about praying. And one, one slave or former slave talked about, um, you know, my grandmother used to, you know, put a mat down facing the east and she would bow down three times, touching her head to the ground. And, you know, the, at the time when people, these um, recorders were recording these stories, they didn't know what this was. This is 1930, 1933. Um, Islam was not, you know, in the consciousness as it, as it would be now. And still it is in the consciousness and half the people don't know what they're talking about when they talk about it anyway. Um, but uh, they didn't recognize um, what these people were describing, but they were in fact describing religious practices of their ancestors that were Muslim. And I want to show two clips of a film that came out in 1991 called Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash, an accomplished filmmaker. And Daughters of the Dust is about a generational change at the turn of the century. It's set in 1901 uh, on the Sea Islands. Um, and the story is about a family uh, where the younger people want to move to the mainland and kind of join you know, the kind of progress with the, the, the rest of the country. And the older people are kind of saddened by the loss of tradition. So that's the, the plot of the film. So I'm going to show two clips that kind of show in Julie Dash's um, uh, memorializing of that culture the presence of Islam. Thank you. 
So that's how Islam functioned uh, as historical recovery. Um, the next is Islam as alternative identity. And what I mean when I say Islam as alternative identity um, is in the 1930s and 40s, well, let me see if I can, okay, yeah. In the 1930s and 40s, there began several movements. So actually, as late as early as the 1913, um, and this, and I'll, I'll get to Noble in a second, but it was one movement started by a man named Noble Jurabi, and his movement was called the Moorish Science Temple. Um, very little of what he taught. Uh, resembled what we would see or understand as Islam. But there were a few major contributions that Noble Jurawi made. One, he introduced the whole um, issue of identity because he called people of African descent in America Moors. And this was his way to rewrite the racial lineage um, and reverse the racial hierarchy. Uh, that had existed at the time. You know, 1910s, 20s, and 30s is the rise of the eugenics movement in America. In fact, uh, American scientists were the pioneers in the, the idea of the master race, which Hitler would later borrow. Um, but part of this was a kind of ranking of people and uh, connected to, you know, kind of great civilization history. And um, Noble Jurali's response to this was to connect people of African descent to the Moors who had not only uh, you know, conquered North Africa, but of course had ruled Spain for about a thousand years. Um, and so uh, this um, was something that he identified as pride, and he felt that in order for uh, people of African descent to be free of racism, not only did they have to reclaim an alternative identity, but an alternative religion. So he said, you know, give Christianity back to white people and embrace your true religion as Moors, which is Islam. So he introduces this notion of Islam being key to taking on an alternative identity. Now, much of this is a play on Orientalism. And I'm drawing on Edward Said's concept of Orientalism, where uh, the East is kind of imagined as this mystical place, this source of spirituality, and uh, that it does involve a kind of exoticizing and fetish fetishizing of the East. So part of this claiming an alternative identity uh, did include uh, taking on artifacts of uh, the East. And Noble Jurali was not the only person to do this. The whole kind of Masonic movement amongst Freemasons, um, you know, the ancient order, ancient mystic orders of the shrine where they took on Arabic names to name their Masonic temples and um, their symbols were the crescent and the sword. I mean, all of this is a kind of Orientalism, but here's Noble Jurali in a kind of Masonic influenced dress with a turban. Nothing like the Moors, but that's beside the point. When an Orientalism uh, obscures these kind of finer details of, of the original culture. Now, why was this um, so important and significant? Well, there were many uh, attempts uh, around this time to begin teaching Islam to people of African descent. And one of them uh, was led by the Ahmadiyyas. And the Ahmadiyyas were a kind of um, a splinter group, and they're, they're very controversial um, because people don't consider them Muslim because their founder, a man named Mursa Ghulam Ahmed, claimed to be the Mahdi and later Messiah. Um, and, you know, they're, they're actually, um, he came from India, the part of India that would become Pakistan. Um, and it's actually illegal to, to be Ahmadiyya there. Um, but their heterodoxy aside, um, they had one of the most organized 